We met Paul uh, about eight months ago, a year ago, where we were doing an event, the DM, I say we, the Digital Maker Collective, we're doing an event at the British Film Institute. Um, and luckily, Paul stumbled across us and was interested in what we were doing. And we got chatting. And we've been chatting ever since. And here we are now. So on that note, I'll pass over. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, as you know, my name's Paul Atherton. The initials FRSA there on the screen stand for a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> Is that back? Yeah, lovely. Um, and I've been asked to talk about welfare and digital exclusion. Um, there's been a lot going on recently with me, which I will talk about a bit later on. Uh, that means I'm pretty well positioned to talk about this particular topic. So we're going to start off with the, this concept of the digital lie. Who thinks life here is better with technology? Yeah, interesting. Who, who, <laughs> yeah, there's quite a few of those. There is. There's quite a few of those. Who, who thinks it's a bad thing? Oh, excellent. We've got three. Brilliant. Um, yeah, I think it's a really bad thing. I think it's a very, very bad thing. And I think the problems come about because it used to be a very good thing, and people still think it is. Um, so when people talk about searching Google, for instance, they think they're searching the internet. Well, that hasn't been true for decades. You search a very, very small section of what Google wants you to find. Um, and the problem with this sort of concept is that everybody's moving online at a rapid rate going, it's just better. Everything's better. And the welfare system has decided to do exactly that. And they're wrong, because it isn't. Um, the problems that you've got are, are widespread. Uh, and the things that they do to address it are really, really problematic. So why am I hosting this debate today? Well, um, I used to work for the Department of Health and Social Security, as was. Uh, I was there during its first initial installation of the first ever IT system in the entire uh, civil service, and it was disastrous from day one. And the reason it was disastrous is because they bought the system and a procurement system that took two years to decide what they were going to buy. In technology terms, that's about a million years. So by the time it was actually installed three years later, nothing worked. And when I say nothing, I mean the computer systems didn't work, the software didn't work, absolutely nothing worked for anybody. And that was millions and millions and millions of taxpayers' money, millions and millions and millions of wasted welfare, um, and it became a total disaster. On the other side, I've worked in public relations for IT companies. So I've been at the cutting edge of the first online video with my client Iterated Systems, the first online banking with Pegasus Software and Barclays Bank. So I've kind of been right on both sides of the coin where there's technology that's just backwards and there's technology that people haven't even seen yet. I am also currently claiming benefits. Now, I suffer with a disability called chronic fatigue syndrome, um, which means at its worst, I can't move. I'm laid up in bed. The worst period I've ever had was around two years. Um, but I get wheelchair bound, I get caught in bed, um, often I get three or four good days out of a week, two or three that I'm not functioning, and then periods of time where I just can't do anything. And because of that, it's almost impossible for me to go to an employer and say, do you mind taking, because I might not turn up Monday morning and not be there for the next two years. Um, so the way I've structured my life is I kind of do TV and film, um, but to support that, I claim benefits, um, and I get incapacity benefit and disability living allowance. Because of that, I've been trying to correspond with the department for some time. Um, and two years ago, they refused point blank to communicate with me by email. The department, who is now telling everybody that everything's got to be done online, are saying they can't communicate 
to claimants via email. And the reason for this, they claim, is because of the Data Protection Act. <laughs> yeah, that is the correct response. I'm not repeating that on Mike, <laughs> but that is absolutely the correct response. It, it, it is a, it's, it's a response to frustration and annoyance. Um, we're at a state now where this, the benefit system is purely designed to stop people accessing it in any way they humanly can. So what's the dilemma? This universal credit is the biggest problem for the benefit system. It is causing people immense hardship. It was never designed properly. They've been installing it for years, and at every point it has failed, and it's ridiculously over budget. I'll come to the numbers later on in this. But everything they do, they're trying to say to people, you've got to go online. You've got to do it via the internet. You can't do it in any other medium. But they won't let you use technology to communicate with them. So it's a one-way process. As long as we can tell you what you're supposed to do, it's great. Technology is fantastic, but you can't come back to us in any medium whatsoever. We can trace you. We can track you. We can control you. We can do everything we want to you, but there's nothing that you can do to get back to us. So this online is better and easier, completely debunked. So they've gone, right, we're going to spend this money because it makes it's easier for the claimants. It isn't. They can't get on there. Two million people in this country don't even have internet access. That's two million people, and they're generally poor, and they're generally vulnerable, and they're generally in outlying areas. Another five million struggle to get online through various reasons, uh, problems with reading, problems with communication, problems with technology, problems with accessing the equipment to do so, it's expensive. Wi-Fi is expensive, computers are expensive, mobile phones are expensive. Um, so this online is better and easier, just not true. The other aspect to this is poor people prefer cash. They like money. They can control money, it's in your hand. It can't be tracked, it can't be, it's, it's there, they watch it diminish. It's a much easier way to budget than waving a phone or a bit of card across machines where you've got no knowledge of what you spent, when you spent it. But when you watch that money diminish in your wallet, you see it go, and you're much, much, much better controlling your money spent. Yeah, online is cheaper. So far, and these are only the last figures, the DWP are currently seven and a half billion pounds over budget on this project. They are the last figures. They were the last public figures in 2016. We're guessing that's gone up considerably since then. And nothing in this system works. The whole point of developing this was that they were going to combine all of the benefits into one single thing. Now, I've always argued that's a good idea. You're having different benefits, different sources that just seem nuts filling in the same application over and over and over and over again. That didn't seem like a practical way of doing things. So bringing them all together seemed like a, a smart idea. But the problem was is that certain benefits couldn't come under this. Other benefits didn't work. The payment system this runs on requires someone to live for two months minimum eight weeks before they make a payment. And this has caused immense distress across everybody in the UK. Um, and this is why these things are, are headline news consistently. Yeah, I, I, does everybody know the term digital exclusion? I, I'll talk about it, but I, um, I, I, can some people give me some examples? Absolutely right. Um, and I think one of the interesting things is it's so often not what you think. Simple things like you think you can get on free Wi-Fi. Your local pub will have it. There'll be things on the street. But if you don't have a mobile phone to get on O2, for instance, you can't do it. Because they want to message your mobile phone number to release the access code to get online. We talked about the departments not communicating with you via email. But I think this one is 
probably the worst. I'll show you a clip when I, I finish this. But there's an attitude that anybody who's poor, homeless, uh, in difficult surrounding, vulnerable, shouldn't be able to afford technology. Shouldn't be able to own a mobile phone or a tablet or, God forbid, a computer. Um, and therefore, if you're seen with one, if you're in vulnerable situations, it's become the new flat screen television uh, for sort of welfare shaming. You know, how can you afford a phone if you can't? How do you get a tablet if you can't? Why have you got a computer if you can't? Um, and I think that's a real major problem, and it, it, it's causing a lot of grief. And as I say, I'll show you a clip at the end of this, which I think is one of the most the worst travesties I think I've ever seen on London Street. But what does this all mean? It means that you're excluded from a society that you should be a part of. The entire purpose of the welfare system is to support you, is to encourage you, is to make you feel part of the society. But at the moment, this doesn't. This is no word of a lie. If you have no money coming in for eight weeks or longer, food banks are available to some people, not to others. There's street foods available to some people, not to others, but there are people dying in the UK because they're not getting their benefits. There are people committing suicide in the UK because they're not getting their benefits. Deprivation, social shame, and we've talked about, and of course, all of this is just a total disaster, and it needs to change. So, what's the solution? Does anybody have any ideas about what you do? to change this system? <laughs> well, I was working with homeless people and there was a company came with volunteers, whether it was accountants or bankers. And one person said, oh, they've got mobile phones. And I went, yeah, um, it's their only means of being able to, to be in contact with their family. And it was just interesting that the person was really shocked you know, because at that, that time, we wasn't even talking about smartphones. We we're just talking about your normal Nokia. And the other thing is, there's a lot of people who are homeless. That's the first time they'll actually use the internet. Then they'll go on Facebook, because then that's a, another way that they can keep in contact with their family. So, but talking about the benefit system, Paul, you need this, you need this to be on TV, because it is ridiculous. They don't contact you by email. You've got to get on the phone. You've got to be holding there for ages. And so it, let's put it this way. It, you could maybe go to a pay phone, but what's the word I was going to say? How many pay phones are working? <laughs> and it might be cold or it might be smelly. Just because you're homeless doesn't actually mean that you smell. A lot of homeless people are actually smarter than the people in this room. If you see them on the street, you wouldn't know the person next to you is homeless. And that's something to think about. Thanks, Lenny. And also, everyone is about a minute away from being homeless, because you don't know. I've met, I've met somebody who was a, a duke or somebody, and he lived in a caravan park, maybe because that's what he chose. A lot of people are homeless for so many different reasons. There was a middle-class girl. She actually liked to live outside. Even in her parents' garden, she slept in a tent. Sorry. This is all, not at all. See, this is what this is all about. It's about sharing ideas. It's, it's, about, <laughs> uh, it's about sharing ideas. It's about coming together. It's about trying to find solutions. Yeah, please. Uh, hey, how you doing? Um, so, me personally, so I, I was born like 1981, I think, if I remember correctly. So, but I know that... Milton Keynes was created in like 1970 something. And that fascinated me because I was originally from Birmingham. We used to always go through Milton Keynes. And I didn't realize that people built cities in that way. You know, yep. you just. So, what, so I think one of the solutions that could happen is I want to know what was the conversation that happened in 1970 something that created a new city? And what's the possibilities of us creating another new city? In, um, in London in some brown space or something like that, simply so that we can start moving people around. Because I've, I work I've worked in a few places, and I know that there are a number of people who are, who are happy to move around England if you can provide them with a place to stay, um, access to services, da-da-da-da-da. 
And I actually think that is one of, one of the solutions, but not the complete solution because moving around is not the solution for everybody. So you've got, you got people who had to move to Birmingham. They, they, they've lived in Lewisham their whole life, but because when they did the, the housing cap and all this stuff, they moved them out to Birmingham. I don't think it's a solution for them. But if you're just a young man, you know, um, trying to find a way in their life, then maybe living in Stoke or some new city or something like that, it could work for you. Um, and 16 billion pounds, I mean, I don't know how much it costs to, to build um, Milton Keynes whenever they built it, but 16 billion pounds is a lot of money. I think it's very scary because I think you could, I don't get why the government, for example, so for example, um, the government could just go to the best IT class, the best IT um, university in England, go to the top class and say to the top class, we're gonna do a project where you've got to design a benefit system. That's your dissertation, right? That's not gonna cost them a penny. All of those youngsters, all those people in that class are gonna be hungry for it, because wow, you know, I mean, when I was at university, I'd, I'd have died if I was doing advertising or something like that. I would have died if Nike asked me to design something for them, even if I wasn't gonna make a penny out of it. So I do think there are ways that the government and people can create solutions. I just don't understand why they don't. What's your name, by the way? Oh, Siddiqui. Siddiqui. Um, excellent point. Absolutely excellent point. I, I, go ahead. Um, as a person who's actually been through that system um, and being treated in a way where, because I'm not terminally ill or I don't have any dependents, I'm not priority. Um, I think it's I think it's something that needs to be redesigned, and the councils need to be completely stripped of certain people that are in charge and certain people that are put in a position of responsibility to help these people. And I think that gentrification needs to be also redesigned in the ways that they're doing things because it's not about building coffee houses in the middle of Brixton or Peckham. And it's not about building all of these really, really fancy flats that are so, so um, expensive and having no parking for them either. It's about actually looking at the communities and looking at the fact that these people have actually built livelihoods around their communities. The, these people People have actually built lives here and um, yeah I just think I, I, I don't know personally what the solution is I have no solution um, but I think that a lot needs to be done and I think it starts with the foundation of it being the councils and um, being the communities and being the people that are put in positions of responsibility to help us so, so what was your name Jay Jay um, you did by the way just come up with a perfect solution that's exactly what we need to do um, and as Sadiqi said the, the, the biggest problem we have right now is that people are focused on money, on gentrification, on cost, um, but they're only looking at it in terms of financial cost. They're not looking at it in terms of human cost or what we're doing or how we're gonna get there or the, the, what, what's really important to people. No one's paying any attention, so they're building tower blocks, which are entirely empty. They're money boxes. People say, oh, the homeless problem, we haven't got enough homes. Rubbish. Got plenty of homes. It's just that they're all vacant because they all people decided to build luxury ones and no one can afford to, to go in there. My, my biggest annoyance, and I'm, I'm sorry to hear about your, your journey, but my biggest annoyance was this concept that somehow, oh, well, you're on benefits, you're getting all this money. And you're like, you know, the majority of that goes straight to landlords, right? <laughs> exactly. That doesn't go into the pockets of people. That goes straight to landlords, and the standards by which the accommodation is, is abhorrent. We don't have anything that's looking after people anymore. We have systems that look after money. Um, so, yeah, what's the solution? Exactly. Oh, sorry, yes, please. I, mean, I think the contributions have been made here are really, really interesting. Um, I'm probably the oldest person in this room, and um, I was active in my working experience at the time when the World Wide Web first became something that the ordinary people could use or it could be used in work situations. Now, it's a wonderful concept, it's a wonderful thing, but of course, the issue that I think everybody's raised here in different ways is who controls it. So the problem we have in this society is not the technology, it's who has the power over the technology and the fact that the World Wide Web has become a, 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 a system for, for capitalism, basically. And our colleague here talked about the time when, in Britain, when they, we were building new cities, at, like Milton Keynes and new towns. That was in a period after the Second World War when there was hope 
there was an idea about social consciousness, there was the concept of never again should we go through the poverty of the 1930s and so on. But of course that, that died politically in a way and we're now living in a situation where everything is used really to increase the power of, of capitalism. So you ask for a solution, my solution is to end capitalism, which is a revolutionary concept. But, you, and you can't really tinker with it. That's my, I, you know, after years of experience of trying to deal with these kind of things in education, in print production, in all these kind of areas where I've worked, I think the issue is we have to have social change. And what's your name again, sorry? Jean. Jean, thank you ever so much, Jean. Has anybody else got any comment? Yes, we have, down the front. So there, there is a brilliant book that I suggest everyone reads, which is called Utopia for Realists. You know it. The solutions are all in there. And I think a lot of the solutions have existed for a very long time. And one of them, and you know, lots, there are lots of arguments about it doesn't work or it hasn't, you know, it hasn't worked, is universal basic income, which it's the perfect solution, at least for now, in the sense that then you get rid of the whole benefit system, because essentially, well, okay, so there you are, <laughs> universal basic income, then you, you get rid of the whole stigma about benefits, and I think everyone will be happier because you, won't, you will no longer just choose a job based on the income you're likely to get. People, I think it could change society overall, but also I think about homelessness, I think they are four to five empty properties for every homeless person, so again, it's it's not about lack of properties, it's about the system needs to completely change. But I think it is possible, and there are more and more countries where this is starting to happen. And it happened hundreds of years ago, universal basic income, it's not a new concept, so. Does everybody know about universal basic income, by the way? Okay, so it's an idea which basically means that we should treat every human being as if they're a human being. So you give everybody enough to live on. It's a, it's, a, it's a welfare system, but it pays everybody. So if you choose to go to work, anything you earn, you keep on top. Um, uh, but everybody has enough to survive and a, 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 at a comfortable, not a rich, but a comfortable level. And then obviously if you want to contribute. Now, sorry, sorry, I didn't catch your name, by the way. Veronica um, made the good point that this, it's not a new concept. It's, it's been around hundreds of years. Adam Smith came when, when he was, um, before he wrote Wealth and Nations, he wrote, he wrote another book, and this was a fundamental tenet, that he goes, I love capitalism, it's a great way of distributing things, but trust me, people are greedy. If you just let them go off on their own, they're gonna go mad. Um, so on the other side, there was another book which went, look, we need this kind of regulation, we need this, and one of the conceits was we give people, everybody, enough to live on. If you go online, I wrote a, a letter to Ian Duncan Smith some years ago, it's an open letter to Ian Duncan Smith, explaining exactly why he should do this and how much it saves, and I broke it down and sort of referenced all the historical points. But I'm, I'm absolutely with Veronica. You, I, the, the problem we've got at the moment is we're trying to tinker. We're trying to fix systems that are fundamentally broken. The Demos report that came out recently basically went, the DWP, the Department of Work and Pensions, is so intrinsically and culturally embedded in being evil that we can't do anything with them. We can't persuade them to be nice human beings. We can't. Shut it down. And I think that's the absolute right way to do it. And it's, it, to me, actually, it's the only way to do it. And until we start seeing things like this, and this, this requires very little to make happen other than power. <laughs> so, please. I mean, I understand the concept. I think it's a good idea, but you'd also have to legislate to say, for example, that nobody should be charged a rent that was more than, I don't know, 25% or 30% of their income. If they want to earn, as you say, more, and then, you know, fine, they can pay more for their property. But everybody, you know, the minute you start having housing, for example, a way of people making a profit, or food being a way of people making excessive profits, you've got a problem. So it's the system, not just saying you, you, you legislate for a universal basic income, you have to tackle the system. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and uh, please. Sorry. Um, I also, in my, in my own head, <laughs> this makes a lot of sense, but I don't know how I'm gonna actually, um, spit out but 
essentially, I feel like the government is made up of people who don't have a realistic sense of how we're supposed to live as um, working class or lower class people. Um, there was a typical example of um, an MP being asked the price of milk and he couldn't tell us. So essentially, I feel like the decision makers should be comprised of normal people, people who haven't experienced the life of um, you know, being fed with a silver spoon and have had to literally experience poverty firsthand. And that's who should be make, be part of making the decisions, not necessarily people who don't actually know what it's like to be in our shoes, you know, and actually experience um, firsthand what poverty really is and homelessness really is. Because I think that it's, it's, almost, it's almost like people who are very insensitive and almost, you know, have no experience and, and, and no know-how really of how to navigate people who are homeless because as I said in my position, just because I'm, you know, I don't have any children and just because I didn't have a, a terminal illness, I was told that if I stay here in this, in this, in this housing office, I'll be banned from here. I'm not gonna be able to receive any services or any help, so essentially, I don't know, I, I feel like one of the solutions should be that whoever are the decision makers should be infiltrated like people, you know, uh, you know like me or you, so, yeah. No, I completely agree with that. I, 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 and this is where, oh, that's disappeared again. There was, um, no, this, I, I, this is what I meant by, you, it, there's no point trying to adjust things. You, you've got to, the, the really exciting part of all of this is that for once in history, all of this is actually possible. Because normally you'd be going, oh, well, what, you, we've got to keep people in work. Well, actually the biggest concern globally right now is what people are going to do when people have no work. Artificial intelligence is coming at a rapid rate. Robotics is coming at a rapid rate. There's a, the, the, the change attitudinally. The notion of money, and I love the notion of money, it's kind of going, oh, yes, yes, money. And it's like, well, where are you going to get it? The magic money tree, and I'm like, yeah. Let's do that. You seem to find 1.2 trillion pounds to bail out the banks. Where did that come from? Because you didn't print it. Because if you'd printed it, we would have gone into hyperinflation. So that clearly didn't happen. So, but you managed to find it from somewhere. And if you can find it for the banks, which by the way, by doing that, you've completely ended capitalism. Um, you know, capitalism says they go under, they failed. Um, but if you bail them out with state funds, taxpayer funds, we've changed the dynamic of our economy. And we're all behaving exactly the same as we would have been doing. People are talking about economics that was devised 200 years ago, 300 years ago in some instances. And you're going, we just don't live in that world anymore. We don't have money anymore. We, we wipe bits of data from one place to another. We don't have controlled circulation. We don't need to work anymore. The idea of sort of a, a slave wage and a slave wa labor, it's gone. So for the first time in history, I believe we're at the precipice of something really, really important. But it's people power, as you say. It is people power that will change this. And it needs everybody to get involved. Thank you. In the UK, we are too complacent. We can sit here and talk about this, but let me tell you, I can see that we've been in the same situation or just a variation of it. We don't really complain. Think about all the things over the years. We're just too complacent. We allow. The fact that the bankers got that money, what did we do to protest about it? Nothing. But do you think we're getting to a point now where homelessness rise is actually getting to a point where even the Daily Mail is starting to talk nicely about homeless people, where they're supporting people on benefits in a way that they've never done. Are, are we getting to that point, or do you think we'll just stay at this complacent level, or do you think things have got to get much, much worse before we start being positive? I think you choose the wrong uh, newspaper to use as an example. Um, <laughs> The Daily Mails just want copies. Um, but yes, if the Daily Mail's talking about it, it means that, yes, it's been wider talked about, but there's a difference between talking, and someone's almost said it, 
and actually doing something about it. And that's what the problem is. I mean, going off topic, and you can keep this out, but knife crime. We're live. Right. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> knife, knife crime is mentioned in the, Daily, in the Daily Mail, but what is actually being done about it? Nothing. Okay? Nothing. Two white girls got killed this weekend and suddenly there's going to be, there needs to be emergency action. How comes emergency action wasn't needed before? Okay? So, we're too complacent and it's about information. I mean, even to find you here, Paul, it was a hard battle. Let me tell you. So, at the end of the day, it's about information being easily accessible. It's about people... I don't know. It's, it's about so many different things. It's about homelessness not being a Christmas topic, you know, because that's what it is. The fact that we, it's talked about sometimes outside of that time, it's like women's issues not being just International Women's Month and is it in the, uh, October? It's all year. It's everything we need to talk about. Men committing suicide, there's 261 a year. Are we talking about that? It's all these things, and it will go on and on and on. You can do surveys, you can have stats. Stats. Surveys are done to get certain information, not to get the truth. If they wanted the truth, it'd be acted on. Because if things was acting on, everything that's happening today wouldn't be happening. Look at the situation with Brexit. We, the adults, can't make up our minds, yet we're expecting our young children to be happy in society and growing up into a frustrated world. And it's taken an Eastern European to let me know that we're not actually going to have Brexit. And he said that a week before. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thanks, Lenny. Has anybody else got any points to make? Oh, thank you. So it's, um, it's a question really, which is do we think democracy is broken, which I think is totally connected to this because are we looking at using the system we have in place which is voting in a government which is going to do the right thing for us um, if you're talking about affecting social change a young lady over there um, is it the is it the best way to do it is to get into lo local government become a councillor yourself and and do it that way is there something you know assuming if, if we do think democracy is broken I think the clusterfuck that is Brexit really demonstrates really demonstrates it, it, it might well be, then what can what what can we do at a grassroots level that kind of overrides that really broken system? Because obviously you need to implement stuff, really radical stuff like universal um, uh, universal credit benefit, universal basic, basic income. income, yeah. You um, you need a government to, to put that in place and a government to, to think about these things. And I think the only party that's seriously talking about it is the Green Party. Obviously, they're really teeny tiny. So I guess my question to everyone is, is democracy broken? And what can we all do at a really basic granular level to override, to override that and just to do stuff without it happening? Thanks, Andy. Um, I think, personally, a knowledgeable people is a dangerous people. And the more that we know, the more dangerous we are. Yeah, that's just my opinion. So I feel like we should not be stripped completely of a government because I feel like if you give the power to the people, we might misuse it. It might be something that we completely don't know what to do with. So essentially, as I said before, I feel like our, our government should be infiltrated with normal people. People who are of lower class, working class, people who probably didn't even get five GCSEs at school. It doesn't matter, just normal people. Because in my opinion, I feel like a lot of money is being designated in the wrong places. And it's not in places that are gonna help us as people, you know, um, come out of the issues that we face. So. Essentially, I won't mention any particular <laughs> points of where the money's going, but 11 million is being spent on something that could be possibly put into building houses for people who are homeless. 
it's not that difficult. Essentially, I think of the price of, of, of little things like pasta and rice and, and, and the tin tomatoes, you know what I mean? Like, it, it, if we actually think about how much money is being dished out every year for certain things, these things are so affordable to our country. We're, we're a capital city, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's not that difficult, but essentially, people that think like everybody in this room that has contributed should be part of the government. It shouldn't be people who are taking private jets to, to, to remote islands and spending it on uh, obscene things. You know, it shouldn't be people like that. It should be people like you and I. So I just think it's not about stripping the whole government and just saying, yeah, let's just have a revolution, no more government, because I think that's dangerous. Sorry, I wasn't talking about revolution. I was thinking, obviously, revolution would be a great idea, but it's really difficult to get everyone out. Um, I was thinking more of... So, assuming we, we're going to have to live with the situation at the moment, which is um, which is we've, is we've got a really fragmented left, we've got um, an increasingly, um, increase, increasingly sort of aggressive right, um, and they're the people who are in power at the moment. And assuming that, you know, we... At the, so for the next few years, we can't really do anything very much about that. Obviously, we will have we'll have a chance to vote quite soon. But I'll, to be honest, we've been voting for right dickheads for the last few the last few times we we gave it a go. In my personal opinion, um, what I'm really interested in is what can be done in the meantime at a really, really basic level. So assuming we are all going to be encouraging everyone to exercise their democratic um, their democratic right whenever they can in um, local elections and all of that, which I firmly believe in, by the way. Um, but what, what, what else can be done? Because it's... That's my question. Hi. Um, so I wonder if this is a conversation about technology or politics, or is it really a conversation about uh, values? You know, because um, I think you know, it's not technology that guides our values. Our values will be whether we use pen and paper, whether we use conversation, or whether we use technology. You know, if, if somehow, you know, I, I, I think along the way we've lost some of those values. And if we somehow get back to humanity, not necessarily politics, no matter which color your politics, shade of color your politics is, I think it's about humanity. And if we all ascribe to humanity and the values of basic values, I think then it's not about technology or anything like that. I, I think you're absolutely right, but I think technology has been a part of the problem to allow people to desensitize, to allow the isolation of individuals. I think things like Facebook and social media, they're, uh, they're embedded now in our culture in such a way that they have so much control how people view and see the world that it's, it is a driver to devaluing values, if you would. Um, and I think that's where a, a big chunk of the problem, I mean, if I literally had a switch, I'd turn the internet off today. Um, and I think you'd suddenly find people connecting again. I think with it, I, I'm rather optimistic. Um, I, I, I see Gen Zs coming through. I, I see people uh, looking and kind of going, no, we, we, we're, we're keeping offline. We're coming off social media. We're, um, we're re-engaging. Uh, Andy runs uh, City Read, which is trying to get people back at using libraries, using paper books. Um, E-books are just as well, if you, you know, but getting people to read, getting people to communicate, getting people cohesive in, in real life situations. And I think technology has been a medium and a means by which to sell. Uh, and that's pretty much all it does now as opposed to what it was created for, which was to share. Um, and I think We've either got to go as a group, a collective group, we've all got to go, no, that's it, we're done. Um, or someone's got to do it for us. My experience so far is we've not been very good at doing it for ourselves, but I think people are fed up. I genuinely think people are fed up. I think groups like this are spawning everywhere. I think people are getting together for no other reason than they want to make life better for each other. 
Um, and I think that's really positive. And I, I, I'm, I'm hearing a lot at the RSA. I'm hearing a lot just generally in these kind of groups. Um, and I'm, I'm speaking to more and more people that are just going, okay, I'm, I'm, we're done with stuff. We're done with stuff. I, I, I don't need to buy any more stuff. Um, what I want is connections. What I want is care and love and affection and humanity and, and values. But you had another question, sir. Well, it, it wasn't a question. It was an answer. So one of the things, like I watch, like I think I'm real smart, so I watch Question Time, right? And um, so I, I think we need to scrap the first past the post way of voting. And I think that would lead to more representation of whoever we want in, 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 in um, politics. So, again, I think it's, it's not, I don't think, I don't think it's, we're big enough or, or I, don't think of, I don't think it's about revolutionary stuff like, you know, scrapping everything. But I think there are certain things that we can put in place to kind of slow down whatever it is that's happening. Um, in regards to the whole technology thing, though, you know, um, the other day I spoke to my gran. Now, my gran's an 86-year-old lady. She lives in Florida. I haven't spoken to her in about 10 years. And I did it by WhatsApp, right? I did it by WhatsApp. It was a, my uncle got a WhatsApp number. I found it on the, online, found him on Facebook. I used the whole social network, and I'm talking to my grandma. Then when I came off, and I haven't spoken to her for a long time, when I came off the phone, I did pause and think, well, look at that. This actually didn't cost me a penny, other than obviously I pay my internet bill and I got a mobile phone and all of that, this kind of stuff. Um, but look what technology kind of kind of did for me. I could video chat, her, right, because of WhatsApp, so I could see my grandma. Now, that was you know, like I said, I haven't seen her in ten years, and she's got dementia and she's losing it. She's on her way out, kind of thing. You know what I mean? And um, you know, for me, technology has value because. Yeah. 15 years ago, 10 years ago, I would have had to have bought a card, a calling card, that would have costed me 10 pounds, and I probably could only talk to her for about ten, like half an hour on a very dodgy line. I remember those days very clearly, do you understand? So I don't think we can just throw out technology full stop. There are some serious benefits, do you know what I mean? Um, she got to see um, my son that she's never seen before, do you understand what I'm saying? And I didn't have to send her a letter, I didn't have to print a, print a picture, Put it in a, in a, what's it called, in an envelope. Send it to America. And in, in maybe in two weeks, she possibly sees it. Do you know, she could see it just like that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a fan of technology, but I do think there are things that we can do in society. And if we're use, especially if we're using laws and rules that are from like 200 years ago, where look, look at the changes that have happened. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You didn't have robots back then, pal, when you were, you know what I mean? We've got robots now. So if we've got robots, we need to start changing like, the way we do things. So again, first past the post, I think that's the first thing that needs to get scrapped. I, I, they're great points, by the way. And um, in, I'm totally pro proportional representation. I, I, think, I think it is a better way to vote. But the other thing I would add to that is I would scrap paying councillors money. Tony Blair introduced a, a sort of stipend, which is in essence a salary of about 37,000 a year to become a councillor. And what that did was it changed the type of people that were councillors. It used to be your local people that just loved the community and wanted to do really great things. And suddenly it was a stepping stone to a political career. So now you do a PSC or you know, uh, a history degree at Oxford or something, and you go, oh, I'll become a councillor. In an area you probably, as you rightly pointed out earlier, you've got no affiliation to, you've got no association to, you don't really care about because this is just a stepping stone to get to the House of Commons, to get into the cabinet, to become prime minister. Um, so I think, I, I think there are a number of things that have to happen at the same time. But the story about, um, the lovely story about you getting in touch with your, your grandmother, I, I'm not anti-tech. As I said when I started, I'm, I'm, I'm very pro-tech. What I'm, I, I'm against is what technology's become. Um, you know, it, it, what you've just described is, is what it should be about. There shouldn't be a cost, right? London has created the internet. Tim Berners-Lee created HTML and said, here, have it didn't patent it, didn't monetize it, didn't try and get anything from it. It's like, no, no, this is something great for the world. Let's go out and share. And the problem is, is that's been corrupted. Just on that, um, I think this year is the 30th anniversary of the World Wide Web and Tim Berners-Lee is creating a new, 
an alternative to the World Wide Web because he's depressed by what's happened to it. I think it's called Solid. I don't know if it's been launched yet, but the idea with Solid is to, to change the way technology has been basically taken over by those who are um, monetizing our data. And the idea of Solid is that the data belongs to us. And so we'll see what happens. But I think there are loads and loads of exciting things happening. Yeah, I think I, I, it's, it's one of the reasons I am so optimistic, you know, even though we're sort of talking about all these dismal and depressing things, it, there, there are real fundamental shifts at massively high levels, which when people unite as a, as a group can get there. How are we doing on time, by the way? Yeah, so I, I, I but, but I, your, your data point, I think this is really, really important for, for everybody in this room, is that we've, one of the things that's changed is our currency is no longer money. Our currency's data. Google, Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, Vine, everybody makes money off us sharing our data. But we give it away in a way I don't think, if somebody said, here's 5,000 pounds, just give it to some bloke on a corner, you wouldn't do it. You'd be like, oh, no, no, this is my money. But we're happy to just give away multi-million pounds worth of data to corporations that are happy to monetize it only for you to use their platforms to sell you things. Um, and I, I think that needs to stop. I think we need, we need to encourage people to just shut down, come off these, 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 these conduits um, and change. I did say I was going to show you something that I, I was just mortified at uh, in the metro the other day. I don't know if you saw it, but it, for me it was really telling about kind of the state that we're in now. Um, so this was a story about a student that spotted somebody outside a McDonald's um, begging for money. And she'd gone into McDonald's and she was about to buy him a meal. And she suddenly spotted him using a tablet. And we mentioned it earlier, this notion of shaming. Um, and I'm not sure this is going to play, but yeah. So this has gone around the internet. A guy in a sleeping bag, trying to cover his tablet, doing whatever he was doing on there. We've got no idea what he was doing on there. We've got no idea how he got it. But a newspaper, our newspaper, decided to run a story about some guy using a tablet. As if, if you're begging for money, you should sell the tablet. And if you sold the tablet, then you wouldn't have any way of communicating with people. You wouldn't have any way of getting online to apply for benefits. You wouldn't have any, we live in a 21st century, it is not a luxury to have a device that connects you. It is an essential, and the fact that we're not applying that, and that someone thought that this was acceptable, and more still that a newspaper thought it was acceptable to run that story, is really telling about what you were saying about value, sir. Um, and I think that's the thing we need to change. And I think on that note, we can sort of move forward and take the positives. You know, Tim Berners-Lee's changing things. We've got some amazing people here that are gonna change the world in politics. We got, you know, if you make those changes, if you, if you get out there and hustle, there are people prepared to follow right now in a way I've never seen it before. And I've been on this planet 51 years nearly. Um, and it, it, it's, it's amazing. Now the, one, the, the thing I'll leave you with last is I said that I won a court battle against the DWP before, a couple of weeks ago. It's not entirely true. I took them to judicial re review at the Royal Courts of Justice. I'd gone in thinking I was going to be able to postpone my hearing, and the judge turned around and said, no, you've got to deliver your case now. And I went, no, uh, uh, all right, um, not really prepared for that, but okay. And I argued the case, which was basically that the... DWP had a responsibility to email people if they requested it, especially if they were homeless, especially if they were ill, um, and especially if they needed it to communicate because of a variety of other things. The judge completely agreed with me on everything in his judgment, and has created case law to mean that anybody that has now got problems with them, they can go and refer to Paul Atherton versus the Secretary of State, and cite the legislation that the judge put in there, sorry, the judgment that the judge put in there, um, and it will now literally get you th straight through a door, um, and the DWP will communicate with you by email. So that's a happy note to get on with.
Thank you very much for coming. It's been a, a, a really interesting debate. Thank you. Wow. Uh, don't all run off. Don't, and you don't run off. That was amazing. Eh? Thank you very much. Um, so we, we need to get this out, right? So we've, we've filmed it. We've uh, obviously the people in the audience that uh, ask questions. If there's anyone that objects to being on the film or anything that's said, please let us know because we want to get this out so you can share it and get this because uh, that was just the most amazing debate conversation. Um, so so please let us know if there's for any reason you don't want that to go out because we want to get it out. So and I guess the other point is. That we, we, the whole point of this event is, that, is to have these debates, and that was fantastic. But we've also got a space over there called Action, and that's where we can turn some of these ideas, or at least start to get some of these ideas into actions. Um, so feel free to follow Paul if you're staying around. Yeah.